Good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. Welcome to today's educational webinar, Nimble Product Content in the Area in the Era of E Marketplaces. This is brought to you by Industrial Distribution and sponsored by Codified. My name is Anna Wells and I'm the Executive Editor of Industrial Distribution. I'll be moderating today's event. So I think it's safe to say that the term marketplace has been everywhere throughout the past year. Um, what with all the big movement from both Alibaba and Amazon. Third-party marketplaces are a great way for distributors to reach new customers and sell more products online, but the growing number of marketplaces also brings new challenges for distributors when adapting product content to meet differing formats and standards. So today we're here to discuss things like how the growing number of e-commerce marketplaces brings new challenges for distributors when adapting product content to meet differing requirements. Uh, how to manage product content across multiple e-marketplaces for improved efficiency and increased online sales, and how distributors can achieve product content that isn't just nimble, but also clean, organized, and optimized for end consumers. So with us today is Jason Hine. Um, Jason is a principal consultant for Codified, and he has a wealth of experience in the industrial distribution sector, including 13 years with McMaster Car and four and a half years with Amazon Supply where he served as Senior Vendor Manager and launched the content team. These days Jason brings his expertise to Codified, uh, a leading provider of product content services and solutions designed to help facilitate top of the line e-commerce. So before we have Jason kick off, I'd like to just mention a few quick housekeeping items. As we proceed with our discussion, if you, if you have any questions for Jason, you can enter them into the questions and answers box really at any time. We'll have a Q&A session later in the presentation where we'll answer as many questions as possible. Um, and you know, we'll try to have somebody follow up with you after the fact if we don't get your questions. So please feel free to keep plugging those in. Um, and then if you'd like to review the presentation afterwards or if you uh, refer a colleague um, to view the broadcast, just be aware that it will be available for on-demand viewing. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to pass the reins over to Codified's Jason Hine. Jason? Thanks, Anna. Uh, and thanks everybody for joining us today for the conversation. <clears throat> We're really excited to, to talk about this. This is an important issue. Uh, I, I think that um, as e-marketplaces continue to proliferate, it seems like about every two to three months we hear about a new one coming online. Uh, and distributors are kind of faced with a lot of decisions to be made about you know, which ones do they want to partner with and what work is involved in doing that, both of which are topics uh, that we'll, we'll cover in the, the talk today. Um, yeah, a little bit more, you know, this is still me. Uh, I have my time at Amazon Supply. I was uh, the first senior vendor manager that they hired, and I spent um, four and a half years there. Two and a half years was to help helping to set up data models and data standards for uh, their user experience as well as onboarding and signing relationships with manufacturers. Um, I moved from then over to we actually launched our own internal content team uh, to create original content around imaging, uh, rich media, CAD models, um, a, a variety of, of, of content assets to, to help differentiate us in the marketplace. And, and prior to that, 13 years at McMaster Carr, uh, primarily in merchandising across uh, probably 12 to 15 different product categories in my time there, but also spent some time doing workflow and process modeling and, and some marketing and customer service. Uh, Codified, uh, we have been around for celebrating our 15th year uh, this year in helping companies in the uh, industrial space figure out how to be effective uh, in their e-commerce efforts. Uh, we're headquartered in Chicago. Um, we do have a European office. Uh, we've got uh, a number of uh, European clients that work with us over there in Market Harborough. Um, we really focus on e-commerce, uh, product master data management systems, uh, helping companies get faster at loading their new products online into their e-commerce experience, uh, helping people get better with uh, their enterprise search efforts. Uh, and, we, and our real differentiator is we, we specialize in the B2B space. We've we have a number of uh, staff and other principal consultants who come from other industry leaders in B2B. Um, and, and so we're, we're not, uh, our expertise is not coming from, you know, helping, you know, people figure out, you know, consumer goods that tend to be fairly easily differentiated. We, we know the technical products and, and we're good at helping people uh, display those. Um, there we are. Oh, yeah, there's that. 
Uh, so a couple of the topics that we're going to cover <clears throat> in, the, in the talk today. We'll talk a little bit quickly about kind of product content, how it was used early on uh, in, in e-commerce versus how it's being used today. Uh, we'll talk about the impact that the growth of e-marketplaces are having on product content and uh, what are things that distributors uh, who are considering exploring opportunities with e-marketplaces need to think about in order to be successful there and what are some process and, and possibly some technology solutions that they can use to drive their success. So with that uh, in mind, let's, look at, let's, let's take a ride in the Wayback Machine and look at e-commerce as it was uh, in the beginning. So when I was first starting to get involved with e-commerce, it was the late 90s and right around the time that you know, the web was just starting to figure out that people actually might want to do business uh, online. And the interesting thing I, I, I take about this screenshot from Granger's old site is, you know, there's no place an order button. Uh, yeah, it, it was just, here's a place to go look at their catalog, here's a place to find their store, here's some services that they offer about us, and then, and then kind of some literature and a resource center. At that time, distributors were really just concerned with getting their products online, just putting it someplace where uh, customers could find information and, and learn about products, which they then would take to their offline conventional ordering uh, experience. Having your product data optimized for e-commerce was not a top priority. You know, people were focused on their brick-and-mortar storefronts, uh, maybe their, then their print catalogs. You know, if they had uh, an e-commerce experience, it was, uh, you know, it was a minority. Nobody was concerned about site search optimization or faceted navigation because those tools didn't exist. They just wanted to get it online. So the early uh, web efforts in this space were, were really a, a platform for print catalogs, and the catalog houses were able to had a little bit of a leg up on most of the industry because they had uh, product content that was optimized for print and that was relatively easy to convert to online, whether it was starting with just PDFs of their catalog pages uh, and then moving to HTML, uh, more conventional pages, and, and then adding incremental services like ordering and, and search and order tracking. They've kind of been evolving over time. The... Um, Traditional distributors uh, early on, for the most part, kind of opted out of, of e-commerce because the you know 99% of their business was coming through their conventional sales channel, um, outside salespeople, uh, inbound phone uh, phone call centers, uh, and that was that was very successful. So there wasn't a need to to move on. So as these catalog distributors kind of continued to, to grow in this space, they, they really started to sharpen their e-commerce strategies. Uh, and their focus was really around driving, how do we get more traffic to come to our sites, whether it was Granger, MSC, McMaster Car, uh, the growth of the search engine optimization efforts, you know, paid keywords. Uh, this screenshot here shows you an example of one technique that used to be very common, which was link farms, um, which you really don't see anymore uh, for good reason. It's, kind of hard to shop this experience. Um, the resources really were devoted around uh, how do I get more and more, you know, it's the if you build it, they will come philosophy. Uh, sites started to become more interactive and um, people started to add more product discovery tools. They improved their on-site search. Uh, they improved their ability to, to browse products by shop by categories. And really by the time that the, you know, by the mid late 2000s to early 20 teens, you know, kind of customer preferences for e-commerce were fairly established, driven largely by the experience that customers had on Amazon.com um, and other B2C sites. Uh, competitors started to become much more common as more and more companies in the industrial space started to realize there was money to be made in e-commerce. And traffic started to become harder and more expensive to, uh, to acquire so the catalog houses had to, had to continue to innovate. They started to use design and, and user interface as a differentiator and, and you know, building a mobile platform. Uh, to this point, 
distributors had not even thought of the possibility of optimizing their data for user experience and traffic on sites other than their own. Uh, and, and most of them honestly still haven't until uh, we got to where we are today, which is uh, the, the growth of multi-channel. Um, having the ability now to, uh, have, to add a fifth output for your product data uh, which is unique and a little bit different. So dis most distributors who are already online and already successful have good strategies in place around kind of the big four, your web, your own website, social media, engaging with customers, print catalogs, mobile experiences. The, uh, the interesting nuance about uh, marketplaces is whereas those first four are all about ingesting data from your manufacturers, your suppliers, and transforming it into basically one set of information that can then be fed to the website, the social media, the catalog, and mobile. Uh, E-marketplaces basically represent a, a new way to publish inf information about your products to an entirely new customer base, one who may not know who you are today. And that's the, really the big differentiator for e-marketplaces rather than waiting for customers to come to you and making investments in traffic development and you know, eyeballs, you take your selection and you go to where the customers already are. But that creates a, an interesting nuance from a product management perspective because you can't consider marketplaces to be a, another single channel for product content like web, social, catalog, and mobile. You have to consider it to be a collection of unique micro channels and uh, again, unlike the conventional uh, channels where you set the rules about how product is displayed, each of these sites usually has their own rules and their own processes that have to be followed in order to be successful. So let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, about what that looks like and how that you know, can impact um, the, the product content that you have to uh, manage. So one of the, most of the channels that are kind of getting talked about right now are, are either brand new to the industry, like a, like a jet.com, and it's, uh, some, might, some have called it a, a Costco-based uh, approach to e-marketplaces, or they are very well-established heavyweights with lots of experience in marketplaces. So eBay is the, the classic example in the North American market, Alibaba, uh, which uh, obviously is, you know, if you can control 80% of China's e-business, you're, you're considered a heavyweight. Uh, and there's also some who are a combination of both, like Amazon Business, which launched last month with uh, kind of a new approach, building off the success that they had with Amazon Supply by integrating uh, third-party marketplaces. This proliferation of sites that is happening that has resulted in basically right now there are dozens of major marketplace sites to, for distributors to choose from. Some are targeting specific transactional types, like reverse auctions, surplus inventory disposal, government bids. Uh, others are focused on uh, specific global markets. Uh, Alibaba, as we said, pretty much controls the Chinese market in, uh, in the Far East, and Rakuten is really known in, in Japan. But in North America, there really isn't uh, a single leader in the B2B marketplace segment today. Uh, so in some respects, the marketplaces in North America here are really where e-commerce was about you know, 10 to 15 years ago. It's a race to build traffic and get more people using each marketplace platform uh, to, to, to make it more attractive to both buyers and sellers. But of course, to create traffic on these sites, it requires product. You know, nobody is going to go shop on a marketplace site unless there's product to be bought. And that requires uh, a lot of sellers, a lot of distributors to go and join these marketplaces and offer their selection up for sale. Now, each marketplace has right now to find a balance between I want to grow my selection very quickly, but I also want to have good, accurate product data to drive uh, product discovery and make it easy for my shoppers who are shopping on my site to find the product that they're looking for. And this kind of tension between I want to make it easy for sellers to load their product so I can grow my selection quickly, and I want to have some basic rules and structure around that product information so that customers can use it to find product, has, you know, it's been interesting to see how different, um, 
how different people have lost, uh, how different sites have addressed this through different um, approaches to either making their uh, requirements very strict or very loose. This results in a lot of variance in terms of how SKUs are loaded onto the various sites between the different marketplaces. Uh, each one of these sites has their own rules uh, around product content and the data models that have to be adhered to in order to load uh, load product effectively, which has, of course, impacted the way that uh, companies who want to sell on these marketplaces have to uh, manage their product content. So the advantage, the nice thing about having, um, you know, no clear leader is you have a lot of choices about who you choose to partner with. But, um, you know, because the, if there was a clear leader, uh, it would be fairly easy to pro update your product content. There'd be one set of rules you'd have to play by. You have to update your internal data to meet that standard, and you're done and you move on. But without a clear market leader, the challenge is a little bit bigger. It means that uh, having product content that can quickly be adapted to any of these e-marketplaces uh, is a key strategic asset that gives distributors a competitive advantage over their competition uh, on these e-marketplaces. So you may have uh, being able to, to be flexible in terms of how you display and translate your data on these different sites lets you uh, experiment with different marketplaces uh, more quickly. You might decide to try uh, to try one site. You might maybe try to invest in uh, a relationship with Amazon Business. Try that out for a little while. If that's not working in, in the way that you want, you can quickly adapt and, and switch over to eBay. You can quickly switch over to Jet. Uh, that flexibility and being nimble and having nimble data gives you flexibility that companies that haven't invested in these processes uh, will, will struggle with. Uh, oops. So let's, let's look at a specific example of kind of how this looks. Um, so let's say we're, we're going to partner with Amazon Business and we're going to load some machine screws uh, into their selection. So one of the first steps typically associated with offering product for sale on an e-marketplace is populating what's called a load template. And that's a file uh, containing information about the products that you're selling and that you want to sell on that particular e-marketplace. So for each SKU, um, the distributor has to populate all of the relevant fields concerning, concerning not just procurement information and ordering the things that the distributor needs to know about uh, you know, pricing, order quantities, package size, weight, kind of the things needed for logistics purposes, but also descriptive information and usually some degree of marketing information, like a description and images, uh, feature types of blurbs. Most e-marketplaces have their own ideas and their own requirements for this product content, including how the product is organized and displayed in a hierarchy, and what the attributes of the product are displayed on the site and used for product discovery. So faceted search, that's you know, the ability to filter uh, online. But you know, I only want to see uh, a quarter inch 20 size screws. I only want to see it if it's uh, made from 316 stainless steel. These sorts of um, filters are referred to as faceted search uh, in the industry. So in this particular example, uh, the distributor wants to set up a machine screw to Amazon Business, the load template, asks for information about the length of the threaded portion of the screw and tells the distributor to load that data into the field on the template labeled length. Great. So we're able to do that. We convert it. We populate that along with all the other data. We submit that to Amazon Supply, the product, or to Amazon Business. Uh, the product is loaded, uh, and, we start to, and we start to see success. So this is great. We'd like to expand uh, our opportunity and maybe add another e-marketplace. So let's look at Jet. Uh, Jet, we go through the same process. Uh, we have to get our data ready for their, their system. Uh, they need the same piece of information, the length of the threaded portion of the screw, but they call it overall length. Okay, so it's a little different. It's, it's not, uh, not overly complicated. I think I can remember that. So we, we load that um, onto their template. It's a slightly different term, but you know, we're, we're able to move on, and we see more success on Jet. Fantastic. So now we decide that we want to add Another, mar another marketplace, we, we load it onto the eBay's B2B platform, and they need that same piece of information, only they refer to it by another term, uh, OAL, uh, in a different field. So at this point, we've got three marketplaces that we're working with, and 
for every marketplace that you add, it starts to become apparent how this can become a little bit of a challenge because there are completely different sets of data models that have to be accounted for every time a new SKU is launched. You have to load it, you have to obviously update it for your internal systems to support your, the, the, the big four conventional channels, your web, social, mobile, and print, but you then also have to go and do it again once for each of your marketplace partners. This means that there are now potentially four different new item setup processes that have to be completed for each SKU. Now, how many products do you have available for sale? Uh, it can be a little intimidating. Uh, and trying to figure out ways to manage all of this can, can quickly uh, get out of control uh, as, as companies try to, to, to expand their selection online. Uh, one of the uh, ways that I have seen companies try to manage this uh, in the past is basically by you know, creating uh, essentially what's a minimum viable product. Uh, and that is essentially the only loading information that is required by the template. Um, you know, part number, price, maybe a short number description, and leaving a lot of the other fields that are uh, op often optional uh, blank. There are consequences uh, to that approach that can be significant. So first of all, there are kind of financial penalties that actually uh, distributors can incur uh, through incorrect formatting. I was reading a, one of the things that happens is w as product is submitted, some of these uh, e-marketplace sites have technology that is looking at the information and using that to classify the product and determine where on the site uh, that product is going to be displayed for purchase. And sometimes if the data isn't correct, it can result in the product being loaded in the wrong place. So I just was reading an article uh, earlier this week about a, a distributor who sold caps for hydraulic fittings. And he had loaded his selection onto an e-marketplace site. And somehow uh, his selection got loaded into the health and beauty portion uh, of that e-marketplace. And uh, as you can imagine, uh, not exactly designed for that sort of use, but a customer uh, on that site actually found it and chose to buy it. For what reason? I do not know. Um, and they, so they bought these caps, uh, realized that they were not uh, appropriate and not suitable for health and beauty, and they demanded a refund. Um, and the, what ended up happening is uh, the marketplace site, because they have their own rules around returns, uh, basically mandated that the customer be given credit for the order and without even um, having a requirement for the customer to return the product to the uh, distributor who was selling it. Even though the distributor had printed a, and sent a prepaid shipping label to that customer, uh, the customer just chose not to send it. And so basically the customer got a free product and the seller uh, received, uh, you know, kind of a negative um, experience on the marketplace, which can sometimes, if too many of them accumulate, uh, result in financial penalties either through chargebacks or potentially even having your seller account uh, closed um, for, you know, poor performance. Uh, another challenge uh, associated with managing a lot of these um, uh, e-marketplace sites is, it, you know, as as you have to fill out more and more templates the time to create and launch product uh, on each, across all of the sites extends, therefore resulting in some lost sales opportunities because you know, your competitors may have already launched it on the site, but you've got to wait another two to three weeks to get it through the, the template process. Another uh, issue associated with some incomplete uh, data and, and poorly populated load templates is, is really in how the product performs on the e-marketplace. So the biggest issue is, with not populating all these fields is a lot of those fields are really important uh, to helping customers find the product. Uh, if you've got incomplete or missing data, means that customers who are using faceted search, you know, if you don't populate the field that drives that search, uh, customers who use it won't see any of your selection. And another common uh, use case that I've seen is uh, sellers not populating um, search keyword synonyms. So if they're, they'll, they'll load kind of, you know, here's our, our keyword that we know drives, you know, is what customers call this. But if other customers call it different things, whether it's different regionalisms, language issues, 
uh, a lot of sellers will leave those fields blank and, and miss out on opportunities to, uh, to, to, to move more product. Um, if you also don't have normalized, consistent information that describes the product you're selling, it can create um, confusion and, and make it hard for the customer to understand uh, that this product that they've found is the right one for them. For example, if, I've, if I'm looking at machine screws and I see two screws on the site that have all of the same attributes, but one is $10 and one is $3, I'm going to be a little curious because there's got to be something that is a difference between these two SKUs that is justifying the price difference, but I'm not sure what it is because the sellers who are carrying that product haven't displayed those differentiating uh, attribute information. So essentially, you know, if customers, uh, if, if sellers aren't populating the right fields, it results in customers not be, not only being unable to find product, but when they do find product, they're hesitant to buy that which they do find, both of which have a negative impact on you know, your conversion rates and sales on these uh, e-marketplaces, which might give the wrong idea that, oh, e-marketplaces are the wrong thing to do. Well, it, it might be the right thing to do, but if it's not done well, it's going to underperform. Um, uh, so what do sellers need to do to structure their product content for e-marketplaces? Uh, the biggest uh, thing that everybody has to wrestle with this actually to some extent today is you know, we as distributors are selling products that we buy from our manufacturers. And those manufacturers provide us multiple types of, of product information. Uh, there might be some legacy data that we have in our internal systems. They're constantly sending us new product images. Uh, they might have created um, – send us updated in Excel files. They might have created XML feeds. Um, it, it kind of is a, a flurry of product data coming in from all of our vendors. And trying to transform all of those inputs into, you know, directly into the marketplaces uh, creates kind of a, a perfect storm of, of errors and, and challenges. So, the first thing that distributors need to figure out how to do is to take this data from all of these different sources and condense it, clean it, and onboard it internally so that they've got a single source of truth for their various marketplace partners. Um, you know, if one doesn't already exist, uh, a distributor is advised to build a, a model for their data that is specifically focused on the selection that you have and that you want to sell. And that, uh, so what is a data model? Uh, data models typically consist of two components. One is the product hierarchy, so what, what are products, how are products organized and grouped? And the next is product attribution. What are the, the aspects of the products uh, that customers need to know to differentiate, identify, and, and choose what they're going to go with? Uh, a product hierarchy is usually uh, seen in the shop by category lists on most e-marketplace sites. It's it, the, the analogy I use when I'm talking about it is if I, if I need to go and buy a men's shirt at Nordstrom, I, I don't walk into the Nordstrom store and immediately know where to go. So what I do is I look for signage. I look for, okay, well, where is the men's department? Okay, the men's department is up on the third floor. I go up to the third floor. I look around for the sign that says, um, says shirts. And, and, okay, it's over there in the corner. It's not pants. It's not shoes. It's not belts. It's not accessories. Go over to the shirt section. Once I'm in within the shirt section, now I need to figure out, well, what part of the shirt section am I going to find my dress shirt in? It's not polo shirts. It's not T-shirts. It's, uh, it's not athletic shirts. It's ah, over here in, in dress shirts. And that takes me to the part of the store where now I'm going to be able to choose from the available selection. It is incredibly important for uh, sellers online to have a very accurate and detailed internal product hierarchy and to have your SKUs classified to that hierarchy uh, in order to speed up your integration with e-marketplaces. And the reason is because most e-marketplaces have their own unique hierarchies that you have to map your SKUs to in order to list it in the right place on the e-marketplace site. So if I've got an internal robust hierarchy with all of my SKUs classified to the right place, if all of my dress shirts are in dress shirts, I can look at the e-marketplace's product hierarchy and find generally one 
node, one, one part of that hierarchy, one of these little squares, and I can virtually then map everything in my hierarchy to everything in that marketplace's hierarchy at a single shot instead of having to go skew by skew through my entire selection. Uh, that's, it's a much faster way of, of classifying selection and generally results in um, product being better classified on the marketplace site, getting exposed to more traffic, uh, and, and getting more eligible customers exposed to your product. The, uh, once you've got your SKUs loaded in the right place, so now I've, I've found dress shirts, now I have to ensure that the attributes that, that really drive discovery on that site are also populated correctly so that I can help my customers find the right individual product to buy. So these would be things like search keywords, uh, again, faceted search attributes, product descriptions, um, you can think of it like I've gotten to my dress shirt section. Well, now I need to know. Well, I, I need to know a specific size. I need to know a specific material. I need to know a specific uh, color. I need to know a specific fit type. That's what helps me choose between the various different men's dress shirts that I have to choose from and find the right one for me. If two SKUs have all the same values, uh, then they're either duplicates or one is missing information. In either case, customers aren't going to buy from you if they don't trust the information uh, that you're presenting. So let's look at, you know, all right, now that we have a data model internally designed, how do we use that to publish uh, out to these e different e-marketplaces? So this is a little graphic that kind of captures uh, an, an ideal world for a distributor's internal product content uh, ecosystem, for lack of a better term. Uh, one way that distributors can better manage your internal product content is to use what's called a, a product information management system or a, a PIM technology. It, it essentially becomes a, a little, um, it's a place where you can store all of the information about all of your products. Uh, and, and so everything that's coming from your suppliers goes into it and everything that gets published out to not only marketplaces but also all of your other downstream processes can also use this as a single source of all product data. Um, these typically work, uh, and oftentimes most distributors have some type of process like this, it just may or may not involve a PIM system, where you're, a, a manufacturer comes up with new product, they send you the literature, you have to in, integrate that into your either print catalogs, you have to train your salespeople, uh, you have to update your website to reflect the new selection, um, and, and then it, it's sent out. Um, with the arrival of marketplaces, uh, each marketplace now represents another uh, place to publish your product content to from your centralized PIM system. And how most companies are doing this today is with people. Um, you know, the difference between publishing to internal, you know, the big four conventional channels and e-marketplaces is the, the need for translation between your internal data model that you've built and the data model requirements for each marketplace. Uh, by staffing people uh, to do this work, distributors have confidence that, you know, I've got people who know this product well enough to understand what each attribute means and why it's important. So for each SKU and each piece of content, the staff member looks at uh, the information we have in the internal system and finds an equivalent field in the marketplace's data model and populates that manually in the e-marketplace template. And if there's gaps, the staff member can help fill them by requesting more information from suppliers. So this is great. The knowledge of how to translate to a particular marketplace gets internalized to that employee. They get better over time, they get faster uh, as they gain experience. But there's a little bit of a risk uh, in having everything go through a person because you know, once if that employee retires or that employee leaves the company, they take their knowledge with them. And also, he, we're all human beings. Uh, if there's a significant lag time between uh, loads from a particular from a particular supplier, uh, there is a risk that they may uh, choose a different uh, naming convention. Uh, there may be some inconsistencies in terms of how they load uh, selection. And the challenge is now, as we've talked about, you know, what happens when you start to add more than one marketplace. You know, now you have a situation where uh, you, know, you have a manual process, and, and manual processes typically don't scale very well. 
So new item launches start to slow down as the available staff have to create and populate load templates for multiple marketplaces. Uh, if there are changes to the eMarketplace's data models uh, that now require updates to all of your existing SKUs, not just new SKUs. So sometimes you know, Amazon will launch new product categories. They will create new attributes that have to be populated and backfilled for all of your existing selection. Uh, there are a couple of ways that um, distributors will manage these types of problems today. Uh, one is uh, just limiting the number of SKUs that they sell through the platforms. Uh, I was looking earlier this week at the sellers who are on Amazon Business today. They've got thousands of sellers, uh, but I find it interesting that the vast majority of them offer fewer than 100 products. So they've, they've kind of, either they're a very, very small company focused on a, a narrow selection, or it could be that with Amazon Business being fairly new, uh, they're, they're just experimenting with uh, kind of a, some of their head 80-20 uh, types of products to get experience in the space and then moving on. But that's, that's one easy, uh, quick way to e experiment with different platforms. Other companies actually will outsource the creation of their load templates. Uh, there are companies out there that will do uh, this type of work. Uh, uh, Codified, of course, is, is one of those companies. Certain e-marketplaces actually require uh, distributors to go through uh, an outsourced uh, content management um, service provider, um, but not all of them do. Amazon Business, I know, does not. Um, and then finally, for some companies that have a, um, a more robust PIM system, certain PIM uh, implementations and providers will have some functionality that companies can use to, to publish in, in different formats and different uh, venues that companies can take advantage of. Uh, but you know, these are sort of the, the ways around to try to tackle this, this uh, manual mapping process. Uh, we do have, there is a new uh, tool that uh, Codified has come out with, uh, which is to use a technology solution to exclusively just to manage the data mapping across different data models. So we, we have a service called Codified Bridge that basically gets positioned in between your internal data model and the models you're using for e-marketplaces. And as SKUs get loaded into your system, the Bridge technology learns how to map that data and, and retains it over time. So there's a machine learning element that means that the more SKUs that get mapped to your marketplace models, the, the better Bridge is able to predict not only what types of products you're looking at to help with uh, classification and placement in the marketplace hierarchy, but what attributes need to be loaded and what values are acceptable. It can even do translation of attribute values from whatever uh, model is specified in your internal model to the acceptable values uh, on the eMarketplace sites. The other advantage about this is it means that only certain types of errors or mapping rejects require human intervention. So you, the staff people that you have doing this work today uh, can scale much more quickly and, and, and start to handle more um, product mapping because the bridge software starts to take over the mapping process and only the only things that the human needs to look at are uh, either errors or gaps. So in this particular example, you can see uh, the marketplace model has a um, – uh, here we go. Sorry about that. Um, the, the mapping here has – the marketplace model has a value of size. And we don't have an exact match in our internal model on the left, but there is a map – there is an attribute for thread size. So we'll, we'll use that and map our value of thread size to uh, size in the marketplace model. The codified bridge technology remembers that and uses it going forward. Uh, in this example, um, point type uh, uh, is a attribute that is in the marketplace model, but not in our internal model. So this is a, an opportunity for us to explore whether or not we as a seller, need to add another attribute uh, to our internal model to fulfill uh, the requirements of the marketplace. The, uh, and as more of this mapping happens by the, the, the human staff member and gets internalized into Bridge, uh, like I said, Bridge gets smarter about doing these automatically. Uh, these types of maps are maintained on a product basis, so it knows that size might mean something different for shirts as it does for screws or bearings. 
so so uh, in these product content distribution tool, you know, what are the things to look for when you're evaluating these types of, of technologies? Uh, the first thing you do is you need to make sure that the tool can handle the number of translations that your business needs, given the number of e-marketplace uh, partners that you have. Um, if, you know, so, so talk to you know, who you're talking to about, you know, make sure that it can handle a, to, to map to more than one uh, marketplace solution. Also make sure that the tool can handle formatting change requirements uh, with limited human interaction. You know, the goal of translation is not just to figure out which attribute on my side goes to which attribute on the marketplace side. It's also to take care of any translation of the values uh, in order to make it truly automated and effective. Uh, look for systems that can provide reporting capabilities around data accuracy and quality. And finally, establish your internal metrics for performance. If this tool doesn't let you load more products at a faster rate, then it's, it's probably not working as effectively as it could, and you should reach out to, uh, to, to your partner to help figure out how to optimize it. So uh, in summary, we'll kind of highlight a couple of uh, different uh, things we've talked about. Uh, we've talked about distributors must have to figure out how to prepare their product content for multiple e-marketplaces uh, in order to take advantage of the fact that e-marketplaces now represent a way for traditional distributors to, to quickly catch up with the, um, the, the e-commerce presence that companies like Granger and, and MSC have seen in pulling you know, 40, 50 percent of their uh, revenues from online channels. In order to be successful, though, they have to have robust product content. It has to be formatted correctly, and it's got to be easy for people to find. Uh, you know, and having the, your, the ability to make your data very nimble uh, so that it is robust and correctly formatted across multiple different marketplaces uh, sets you up for success, regardless of which e-marketplace becomes the industry leader. Manual processes can be very difficult to manage, especially as uh, e-marketplaces proliferate and the scale becomes big. And distributors really need to think about their processes and potentially technology uh, to really manage and distribute co product content effectively. Uh, it, can make a, it can make a big difference between um, being successful in these e-marketplaces and seeing incremental growth and in revenue from new customers and spending a lot of time and money to load product but not actually seeing sales and traffic as a result. So with that, I will uh, say thank you all uh, very much and um, open the floor to, uh, to some Q&A. Great. Thanks so much, Jason. Um, you know, I think you gave us a lot to think about here and probably raised quite a few questions. Um, I know I have some. Uh, at this point, I'm going to introduce um, Brad Johnson, who is the Vice President of Software Sales at Codified. Brad's going to join the discussion here during the Q&A to field any more technical questions that um, the audience members might have. But before we get to the audience, I'd actually love it if you guys could address a couple of things for me just because um, you know, it's just such an interesting topic. And you know, before the presentation kicked off, Jason and I got into sort of a, a fun um, discussion about <laughs> Amazon Business and some of the implications here. I know there's a lot of questions from our distributor audience, but um, you know, one thing that I'd love to some insight on, I think, is you know, we see that a lot of distributors when they are looking at evaluating whether to join a particular e-marketplace. I think there is a lot of concern about missing an opportunity, but I think there is also on the flip side concern over what they are going to give up if they do this um, and maybe where to go. So could you tell us anything about what a distributor might consider when evaluating whether to join a particular e-marketplace? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, for me the biggest the, the, the the biggest thing that a distributor needs to think about when they're when they're trying to choose from, you know, and there are a lot of e-marketplace options. Uh, the the first thing you need to think about is the reason that you really want to join the e-marketplace, and then make sure that that e-marketplace that you're considering um, meets those needs. So we've talked a lot in the talk today about the advantages of traffic. So if I if I'm a, a small traditional distributor and I'd like to get uh, some, some new customers to come you know, from online, um, you know, it's going to be much easier for me 
to do that if I list my product on a platform that already has uh, a lot of customer traffic, a lot of customers coming and shopping for products. So if you can get information on uh, traffic patterns and traffic volumes for a site, how many sellers do they have? How many customers do they have? How many products do they have? If it's, if it's low uh, vis-a-vis other uh, marketplaces uh, in, that are in your geographic area, uh, then it may not be the right one for you. Uh, in general, I say go for, the, go for the biggest ones, go for the ones that have the most traffic because the, the most traffic you can have uh, means more likely customers for your product. And especially if you have your product set up correctly in compliance with their product data model, but you can look and see that a lot of your competitors on that particular site have not because a lot of the SKUs that they sell are lacking in attribute data, are not classified correctly, that's an opportunity for you to come and actually take share because if the, if the traffic numbers are high and your competitors are not displaying their product well, what you have is a lot of customers coming into the store and not able to find what they're looking for. If you then have a great data model and well, clean and consistent selection to offer, even if it starts with a small number, you're much more likely to be successful. The other aspect to consider is geographic uh, range. So the, a lot of these e-marketplaces are very global in nature. So if I have a vest, even, and even though we've talked about just within North America, let's say that I'm considering trying to you know, develop some overseas markets um, if I'm looking to sell to Japan, I'm looking at something like uh, a Rakuten. If I'm looking um, in China, I'm looking at Alibaba. If I'm looking at India, uh, I might be looking at something like a, uh, a Flipkart. Um, I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not as familiar with uh, the, the European marketplaces. They tend to be uh, much more um, diverse. Um, but I'm, I'm sure if, I, if somebody wants to know more about, you know, European versions, I'm happy to, to kind of look into that a little bit. Just, uh, just send me your email address and I'll, I'll kick that over uh, when I get some after the, after the call. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, but yeah, those are, those are the things that you know, I, I think are the, the first things to consider. One is, how much traffic does the site have? Two, what does my competitors' uh, products look like on that site? And three, is it in a geographic area that I'm looking to uh, service? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and just for the audience, um, I see a lot of questions coming in now. Um, so just a reminder that if we don't get your question, um, we'll have somebody, uh, Jason or somebody from Confide, follow up with you. So keep sending mm -hmm. in questions um, regardless of the time. Don't worry about that. Um, one more thing uh, before I take it to the audience, Jason, and you mentioned this um, earlier in your presentation where you were talking about how some of the e-marketplaces, um, you know, what do you do if they start adding features or fields, about, um, how the data requirements for the e-marketplaces might change over time and how that should sure. be addressed? So um, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. The, um, so because for the most part, these, these sites, these marketplace sites, aren't necessarily being built by people with a lot of expertise in, in the industry, especially in, in industrial. I mean, um, you're, you're still looking at, you know, one of the reasons that traditional distribution continues to be very successful is because we bring uh, expertise about product discovery and, and what are differentiating features, right? These e-marketplace sites are still a little bit earlier in that curve of learning. They will get there eventually. It's going to take them time in order to understand for the full breadth of product uh, that Amazon and, and uh, these, these sites are trying to sell, what are all of the attributes that companies really use? So every, I'd say about every month or so, um, at least Amazon releases kind of a, an update to its data model. Uh, usually what those changes consist of is uh, adding of additional categories to their product hierarchy. So as, as they develop that, hey, there's this new type of, of bearing that isn't accounted for in our current hierarchy, they'll add a new area of the store, what's called a node, to that hierarchy. 
And if you have selection that's been classified uh, to a different node because there just wasn't a good place to put it, uh, the expectation is actually now you're going to want to reclassify that product to this new node because that's going to be the destination where traffic is going to be routed. If you leave your selection in the old node, uh, it's unlikely to sell well because you're just not going to get enough traffic uh, to, that, to that platform. Um, you can also find Amazon occasionally adding new attributes uh, to their data, to their attribution uh, as as products get developed and selection expands, you need more attributes to differentiate uh, the, the, the different selections. So I, I personally, was, when I was at Amazon, I was responsible for adding probably 150 to 200 attributes to their, uh, to their uh, catalog, specifically for the industrial products that I was managing. And, and you know, they, that, that continues to, to happen. Every time they add a new type of product, and, and we all know Amazon loves to add product. Uh, we, we would have to update the data model accordingly. With every one of these changes that happen, whether it's new nodes being added to the hierarchy or new attributes being added to the attribution mix, um, distributors and sellers are always best served by going through their selection and, and updating all of the SKUs where those changes would be relevant. Because if you don't, then Amazon and, and Alibaba and uh, Jet are going to create discovery tools to, for customers to, to leverage that attribute uh, as part of their product discovery. So if you don't have it populated or it's not populated correctly, every time customers use that tool, your selection is likely to get missed. That's a really good piece of advice. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, we're going to uh, take some audience questions. We have a ton, like I said. So, um, uh, Jason, what can you tell us about the mapping software tool? Uh, um, somebody wants to know in the audience, does the mapping software tool work for inbound product content from vendor data as well? Oh, yeah. Um, yes, it does. So, yeah, it's, it actually works um, in, in both ways. You can use it to clean up and normalize uh, the, the, the data where, you know, if I'm buying abrasives from 3M and I'm buying abrasives from Norton and I'm buying abrasives from Pacific and I'm buying abrasives from VSM, you know, they all use different terminology. They all use different, um, they might have it classified differently. They might be sending it to you in different formats. You can absolutely, just like you, we've described here, using this product transformation tool, the bridge software, to go from my internal system and push out to my marketplaces, it can also help to transform from my different supplier sources into my internal um, content management system. Absolutely. Gotcha. Okay, um, we have another question from the audience that, um, you know, I'm not sure if you can answer this or not, but. Um, uh, this, and you had mentioned before a level playing field in a lot of different global um, e-marketplaces that we're looking at. Can you tell us who the dominant uh, player is in Europe? Uh, boy, um, I don't know. That there is a I don't know that there is a <laughs> dominant player in in, in Europe. Uh, certainly not to the extent that you know Alibaba and Rakuten are considered uh, dominant players in 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 Asia. Um, I, I'd be happy to kind of look and see what the current um, what the current um, it's uh, it, it's it's been a while since I've looked at Europe, so I just want to make sure I've I've got the current data. Sure. Okay. So well, you can take that one offline. How about? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, so here's another question that I think probably a lot of people in the audience have, um, which is, what is the easiest and least expensive way to take a large catalog onto Amazon, eBay, or Jet? <laughs> um, well, so again, it depends on your definition of large. Uh, I, I've <laughs> worked with some clients who've thought, you know, 10,000 SKUs is large. I've, I've worked with clients that have had, you know, 600, a million SKUs. Um, the, the, the biggest, so e let's start with, let's parse this question, easiest way. Uh, there is no easy way, uh, provided that you don't have good, clean internal data. So if, if you have very 
well-structured, well-designed, normalized, cleaned up internal data, it can be much easier uh, to, to load uh, these files. They typically um, – they, they can sometimes accept a, a comma delimited file, but usually what ends up happening is they have a template that you have to download and, and populate in their format. So that's, that's where the translation um, comes into play. I have, to, I have to download their template, look at the attributes that they are requesting to be populated for each product type, and then you know, pull data from my systems and populate those templates uh, individually. Uh, it, some of these entities, some of these marketplaces have services that um, you, know, you, can, you can pay extra money for to load it onto that specific platform. Um, but that's, you know, if you've got a really large uh, catalog of product that you're trying to load, um, it, it's unlikely that you're going to be able to create one comma delimited file and submit it to Amazon, eBay, and Jet and have them all accept it. Um, because they, each of them thinks that they've built a better mousetrap from a customer experience perspective. So they have different attributes. They're calling different attributes the same attribute by different names. They're using them in different ways. They might have formatted them differently. Some of them might you know, for a length. Uh, so Amazon, for example, if you want to load length into Amazon, you have to put a number, space, and then the word inches uh, if, if it's an inch delimited uh, tool. Other companies might have the unit of measure in a, as a separate field. Uh, it, it really does kind of depend and vary, and that's, that's kind of the core uh, challenge that, that we've talked about today. Absolutely. I wish I had a better answer for you. But it's, yeah. uh, <laughs> Wish it were easier, right? <laughs> yeah, I um, Another question kind of along those lines, but this is in regards to um, a site like Amazon that has their own international sites. So mm -hmm. do you know, is Amazon consistent with its requested product attributes across all of its different country sites, so Canada, England, France, Japan, etc.? Um, so it, it depends, if I'm remembering right, and it's been a while, so forgive me if I've uh, – if I don't remember exactly. One of the things that I remember being a, a differentiator across the different country sites for Amazon was some uh, of the country sites have different regulatory requirements that have to be complied with that result in a need for different um, – uh, in Europe, uh, one of the big ones uh, that you'll see a lot is uh, Rojas uh, compliance, restriction of hazardous mm -hmm. substances on materials that are – you, oh, sorry, in electrical or, or water, uh, those are kind of hard and fast rules regarding, um, uh, regarding uh, Europe. But in the U.S., it's kind of, you know, it, it's, it's, it's available. It's an option, but it's not nearly as enforced as regular, rigorously as in Europe. Uh, in terms of descriptive attributes, there tends to be at least a very high, high correlation. If not, um, you know, usually what ends up happening is the uh, overseas sites, when they are making decisions about what product lines to launch on, say, Amazon.co.uk, they look at the current selection of what's happening here in the U.S. as a, as a model to follow. And it usually will, you know, so the, the attributes that are being used in the U.S. will usually uh, be incorporated uh, in, in some degree uh, of what's going on in, in Europe, provided that those attributes are enabled for that, that part of the store. Mm -hmm. So um, it looks like we're about out of time. We're pressing up against the hour here. So um, like I said, all the questions that we didn't get to, um, we'll have somebody follow up with you guys uh, to answer those directly offline. Um, and then uh, keep an eye out for an email from us. Um, we'll send you a link to the on-demand version of the webinar so you can share it. You can view it again if you'd like. Um, if you, uh, yeah, if you need anything from, from us or from Codified, you can always email me at anna.wells at advantagemedia.com, and we'll get your message passed along. Um, I want to thank Jason again for a great presentation. I think that um, you really, like I said, you gave us a, a lot to think about. This is sort of a, a knotted, complicated issue, and um, you really did clear some things up, I think, on the product content side. So thank you so much for the great presentation. And um, thank you to the audience for attending today, and I hope everybody has a great afternoon. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, everybody, for joining us.